Hello and very welcome to this interesting and very important policy brief on scaling up agroforestry by Agroforestry Network. My name is Charlotta Szczepanowski and I will be the moderator today. Uh, I'm also the, the chair, bo board uh, president of V Agroforestry. Uh, in Swedish we call it Viskogen. And V Agroforestry is a proud member of Agroforestry Network. And in a minute I just will go through a bit about the Agroforestry Network. And then I will leave the floor to Linnea who will present a brief. And then we will have a panel debate with, with interesting panelists. And then we will have some questions from the audience and then we make a sum up and we will end this uh, webinar in at uh, 15. Oh, uh, 15. Um, but before we start I want to um, say something about the important UN um, uh, biodiversity meeting that is going on right now the COP15 and we're launching this brief because we think that agroforestry is such a good way of working in order to, to make better biodiversity. So therefore we have the launch at the same time as this important meeting in Montreal. So, but something about Agroforestry Network. Uh, Agroforestry Network is a platform for international agroforestry practices. We're based in Sweden, uh, but we, we work to promote the use of agroforestry in development uh, countries. And other organizations beside V Agroforestry is World Agroforestry, also known as ICRAF, uh, SLU uh, Global, part of Swedish University of Agriculture Science, the Swedish International Agriculture Network Initiative, SIANI, Swedbio, a program at the Resili Stockholm Resilience Center, Agroforestry Sweden, the Forest Climate and Livelihood Research Network, Fokali, and NIRAS Development Consulting, and also the Swedish Society for Natural Conservation. And the policy brief today is about scaling up agro agroforestry and it focuses on opportunities, barriers and actions for speeding up agroforestry systems uh, more widely. So I will now give the floor to Linnea who will present the brief. Mm -hmm. So Linnea, go ahead, the floor is yours. Thank you, Charlotte. A great introduction. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Linnea Pasquier and I worked as a consultant for Viago Forestry a year ago and this is when I wrote the policy brief called Scaling Up Agroforestry. So uh, today I will give you an overview over the brief content and last you just said Charlotta the brief addresses the most important opportunities, the barriers and the actions for speeding up the upscaling process of agroforestry. So these are the topics that are raised in the brief and uh, this will also be the presentation outline for today. We will begin with agroforestry in a nutshell for those who are unfamiliar with the concept. Then the sustainable development goals in relation to agroforestry. Then we will define scaling up, uh, the barriers and the risks when scaling. And we'll finish with recommendations for policy and decision makers. So what is agroforestry? Uh, FAO defines it as an integrated land management system in which trees and shrubs are deliberately managed together with agricultural crops and or livestock. So agroforestry really combines sustainable agricultural practices with tree growing which results in this ecologically intensified land use because we have trees that provide one product and agricultural crops and animals that provide another one and this is an ancient practice so it's not new and it suits uh, many different socio-ecological settings all the way from sweden down to the south so, uh, agroforestry actually has the potential to improve ecosystem services, local economies and rural livelihoods. And it has so many positive outcomes and it can contribute to 9 out of the 17 SDGs at least, which are the ones that you see on the slide. Uh, so, it's a great farming system 
when it's designed and implemented based on context. And we have, it's actually praised in many international policy meetings. As you see here, we have the United Nations uh, Food Summit that was last year, and the Convention on Biological Diversity, and many others. Um, so before moving forward, I think it's very important to define what scaling up means, because some people may only think of geographic expansion, but the concept is actually much more comprehensive than that. So in the brief, we define it as the expansion, adaptation, replication of successful innovation, policies, knowledge and programs that can deliver larger and more sustainable results for a greater number of people. A long sentence, but uh, an important one. And to make this more concrete, we have limited it to four main ways to scale up agroforestry. First, we have identify and develop markets for agroforestry products. And this can be through creating fair partnerships that connect farmers to local markets or processing industries. Secondly, we have support farmer adoption. And here we have information sharing and also increasing access to quality planting materials, a very good example. Thirdly, we have improved extension delivery services. And this could be done through farmer organizations, also extension and advisory programs. And lastly, we have improved agroforestry technology. And here we have innovative research and development on agroforestry systems across larger spatial scales and not just the smallholder systems. So we have now established what scaling up means. Um, however, this is an important quote, a successful upscaling process must be context specific and ensure participatory methods. Because we really need this adaptation to local conditions, the resources at hand and priorities of farmers. And this is really highlighted in the brief and needs to be taken into consideration when talking about scaling. Opportunities. So we have this increased international attention towards agroforestry, which is great, but also very serious challenges that are facing the agri-food sector like climate change, food insecurity, malnutrition, and on and on the list goes. And actually these provide key opportunities for scaling up agroforestry. And I will go through the ones, the examples from, from the brief. So first we have that agroforestry addresses land degradation, biodiversity loss, and climate change. Uh, it actually increases resilience to extreme weather events and simultaneously also sequesters carbon in biomass in the trees and in the soils in the root system. Uh, so scaling agroforestry directly contributes to the achievement of, we have like Rio Convention and other frameworks and international targets. Recent agri-food system shocks have exposed the vulnerability of regional supply and value chains. The COVID pandemic is a really good example of this. It's, it was a huge shock for everyone. And diverse agroforestry systems can actually shorten supply chains and strengthen smallholders' adaptive capacity to future shocks. Agroforestry innovations already exist in policies. Uh, we have several countries actually that have adopted uh, national policy support, uh, actions and strategies um, that are directly promoting agroforestry adoption. And in the brief, we have mentioned examples from Kenya, from India, Nepal, Rwanda, and we have many other examples. So this can really be a source of inspiration for other nations, something that they can adapt to and replicate. There's a growing body of scientific knowledge. We have universities and agroforestry research centers, like you mentioned, ECROF, uh, that have existed for decades, and they continuously prove the benefits of agroforestry. So we have the research backing this up. 
successful agroforestry projects with far-reaching impacts are already completed or ongoing. And many of these systems are even mechanized, as you can see on the picture here on the left side. Um, and this proves that traditional knowledge really can marry modern technology. They are not two separate things. Agroforestry provides income diversification opportunities for rural people. It is an innovative system and it actually promotes employment opportunities. And as a result, then labor migration may be reduced, which is a huge problem today. And lastly, we have agroforestry addresses malnutrition by diversifying diets for consumers and farmers. Uh, it can provide farmers with a range of different like fruits and nuts and leaves and crops. And this actually can be either like used at household level for consumption or it can be sold and used as market revenues. So we have all these amazing benefits, but despite them, the agroforestry sector is being prevented from being scaled up by several barriers. And I've divided them into four categories. So we will begin with that agroforestry designs are, they are knowledge intensive and time demanding. There's this longer gestation period, naturally, of course, when we talk about trees in comparison to annual crops. Uh, then we have farmers in experience with managing these more diversified systems and trees for that matter. And this is particularly a problem in the global north. Then we have prolonged profits. There's a slow return on investments when we talk about trees and high costs uh, when it costs a lot to implement trees. Then we have poor extension services and this is in relation to funding and training. Also lack of quality planting material and large scale research. Then we have unclear land rights. And as I just said, testing and adopting agroforestry takes time. And in the absence of like this clearly defined and stable property rights, as it says here, both farmers and pastoralists are reluctant to invest in tree crops invest labor and invest capital. Uh, because why would they invest in something if they don't even know if they will live on the land a year from now? Uh, poor market structures. So at market level, we have these poorly developed value chains and markets, especially uh, non-timber forest products and indigenous trees. Then we have inadequate marketing infrastructure for agroforestry products and high transaction costs, which risks lowering the profit for the farmer. And lastly, we have unsupportive policies, uh, lack of collaboration between governmental sectors. And this is a huge issue because agroforestry cross cuts many different sectors, um, specifically agriculture and uh, forestry departments. So we really need to increase this collaboration across ministries. Risks. Um, yeah, scaling up any agricultural system is really not a value-free process and it can include trade-offs. And one risk is that policy measures and large projects uh, really promote market-oriented tree species and large tree planting initiatives. Uh, and these are often known as um, industrial agroforestry plantations. So it's basically monocultures, but with trees. And this is a reoccurring uh, thing that's happening. Another risk is pseudo adoption in projects, which means that farmers only practice agroforestry technologies when a project supports them with like quality planting material or, or um, or capital, then they quit. And so we really need this long-term planning when we talk about agroforestry activities for scaling. Recommendations. So based on the barriers and opportunities, we have seven recommendations for policy and decision makers. And we conclude that if these recommended actions are addressed, 
agroforestry can really realize its capacity to uh, to more sustainable landscapes and to food systems across the across the globe. So first we have develop national agroforestry policies, strategies and action plans. And these really need to emphasize the importance of trees in rural development and also organize this cross-sectoral coordination across ministries. Uh, and Ethiopia has, for instance, done this. So this is also something that we can draw inspiration from. Ensure a participatory approach and context-specific implementation of diversified and indigenous agroforestry systems. Thirdly, identify and reform restricting land and tree tenure. Here we need to take into account the gender dimensions because female farmers often ac lack access to land. communicate the know-how, and this could be by increasing investments in both extension and advisory services. Also, farmer cooperatives and learning networks can be used as a way to transfer knowledge both within communities and to them. Five, increase financial incentives that, and investment that add value to the agroforestry sector. It is super important to really emphasize the economic benefits and increase them. And this could be in the form of payment schemes for ecosystem services. Also insurance systems and grants. And we have many other examples also in the brief. Improve market access and develop value chains for agroforestry products. And this can be by linking farmers to local markets, also promoting agroforestry based businesses and producer groups is super important. And lastly, we have invest in adaptive and inclusive agroforestry, R&D. And such an investment must really ensure co-learning between both like farmers and researchers, uh, the government and other stakeholders. So yeah, that was the summary I had for you. Thank you, Linnea, Thank you. for a very clear and, and in, informative um, presentation. So I will start and introduce Elaine uh, from uh, Food and Ag Agriculture Organization of the UN, FAO. And Elaine, I think you're in Bogota, is that correct? Correct. I'm currently in, in Colombia. Yeah. Welcome and thank you for joining. And then I will introduce Judith. She's from European Agroforestry Federation. And I think you're in Hungary, right? Yes, exactly. I'm in Budapest. Thank you. Good afternoon to everybody. Thank you. And I've also heard that you're an organic fa farmer and that you're practicing agroforestry in your farm. And then exactly, I want to yes. introduce uh, Elisabeth Similton from SIDA, the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency. And you're a senior policy specialist on agriculture and food security and has a long experience of climate adaptation, which is of course very important right now and will be even more important in the future. Uh, and then I want to introduce Emily Molin, Swedish Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation. And you have a forestry background and experience from sustainable management in the forest sector. Very welcome to you as well. And then Sara Furehed, who is also on the on, uh, in the digital format here. And she is from the Swedish Board of Agriculture and has a Master of Science in Horticulture. Very welcome to you as well, Sara. Thank you very much. So I, I want to start with a question to all of you and we just take a round uh, and I want to know the opinion about the policy brief that Linnea just talked about uh, given your professional background. So I think we'd start with Elaine and I should say that you have a long background. I've read more than 12 years in the, within the area that we're talking about. So very interesting to listen to you. Please go ahead. Thanks Lotta. No, oh, I think, you know, when I first think of what is the potential of agroforestry and how do we scale it up, the first thing that comes to my mind actually is a question. Why has this not happened already? You know, as as um, as Linnea pointed out, 
agroforestry practices have been around for centuries, if not millennia, and it's also been promoted as within the international development um, agenda for over 50 years, particularly in terms of subsistence and emphasis on it, the environmental benefits. And I think this is, and I and I think this is really well outlined um, in the policy brief. What have been the barriers in terms of of reaching up the scaling up potentials now? And I think one of the issues that we don't talk about enough are the socioeconomics of agroforestry. And this is really an area where research is lacking. I think there was mention of there's there's a lot of research on agroforestry, but we really don't have a lot of information on the socioeconomic benefits of agroforestry beyond the the major commodities. Um, and I think this is this is something that we really need to think about. So personally, when I read the policy brief, I, I found myself thinking, we need to reframe how we promote agroforestry and implement it. We really need to think about what will attract farmers to uptake agroforestry. And you know, co-development was mentioned in, 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 in the policy brief. But I think we also need to ask what will attract public and private sector investment. And I and I think we need to put greater emphasis on the word systems in agroforestry systems, where we're promoting agroforestry as a food production system, as agribusinesses, rather than just the land management system with environmental benefits. So in fact, I would say this is maybe one thing where we often do this in agroforestry. We first focus on, you know, what are the environmental benefits? How, how do we make this a, a better for land? And I don't think that's mm -hmm. ultimately what attracts a farmer or even the public sector governments to support agroforestry. So we need to, you know, design, imp manage agroforestry systems with short, medium and long term returns. I think, you know, growing trees, it's not, it, we're talking about three to eight years um, minimum, you know, 25, 30, if we're talking about wood products. Uh, so how do we get the short and medium returns on investment and get access to a pr uh, appropriate supply and value chains and invest in market development? So I actually really appreciated that Linnea mentioned market development first uh, when she was presenting uh, presenting the policy brief. Um because I think we need to promote the innovation potential, uh, not only in terms of source and genetic materials, but also in terms of design management. And really, we need to start talking more about agroforestry as agribusiness and focus on agribusiness development. Um, and I think words matter. I, we, we talk about agroforestry projects. Projects, I think for a lot of people, we think about three, five, maybe we're lucky, six to 10 years of, of activity, I think we need to start talking about agroforestry initiatives or, or things that are longer term um, and, and involve more than just a project cycle. Um, and so ultimately, I think in summary, we need to reprioritize our arguments, focusing on how agroforestry can return on investment, re regardless of scale, if we're talking about a farmer at a plot or even government at a national scale. Um, and and we need to really and we need to go beyond the the farmer plot. We really need to look at the entire production system, supply chain value value chains, and and market development. And I think this is the future of of agroforestry and how we'll also attract younger generations into um, engaging in in agroforestry. Thank Thanks. you, Elaine, uh, for very interesting uh, conversation. I think what I hear is that it's very much about like selling in agroforestry to the right target group and have the right arguments and also see it as a system. And also, of course, the market, uh, you're, you're really lifting the market and the social economic aspects of, of agroforestry. So thank you for that. The same question, what is your perspective on um, on uh, agro uh, on the uh, p policy brief. Yes, uh, I think I would be a little bit in line with Elaine, but maybe from a different angle. So, I was uh, while reading the um, brief, I was actually delighted to see that um, the emphasis on the social economic context. I find it really important. I think that without having in consideration these aspects, we cannot even see how 
how multifaceted and, uh, and versatile um, agroforestry is. Because agroforestry is in a way, is much more than agriculture. It is landscape management, it is, uh, it is rural uh, development actually, it is, it is natural capital management. And if uh, and food production. So if we see it as a system which provides uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services, also not only, let's say, sellable products, it might still not convince farmers. I know that because I'm a farmer and I know my co-farmers, but <laughs> it might be a point that is um, a selling point for decision makers, I think. Another thing that I was very delighted to see is the mentioning of um, traditional farming, uh, farming methods and traditional landscapes. We could say, well, I am coming from Europe, so I am uh, talking from a European perspective, and we could say that actually in Europe we do not have very much uh, traditional landscapes left, though those that we have left, are actually teaching us in these latest periods how much more resilient these landscapes are and these agricultural systems are. And also that these remnants of, or at least I can talk about Hungary, my uh, farm is uh, an old wine hill, and these places act like, like um, biodiversity pockets in a way. So they affect in this sense even larger uh, territories in the in agricultural lands. So I think that these are two very very important aspects, and I sometimes don't feel them very much emphasized in the in in the European uh, environment of talking of this topic. And so some general remarks. If uh, I have, I should talk about the um, European context. So. Uh, I think what I started with, the potential of uh, agroforestry is much greater than it is uh, maybe recognized. Even in, in the European strategies and uh, emission targets and like LULUCEF re regulation or the net zero emissions across the land sector, I follow it is known, or the framework, framework for a certification of carbon renewables, the removal, sorry, uh, they all concentrate when they are measuring the uh, the impacts, the results of these programs. They almost always just leave out uh, the trees outside, the performance of trees outside forests. So this impedes us to understand how much potential agroforestry really has. So I think that it is a very important. Uh, both technically and as an approach to understand that we have to measure the performance of trees outside forests and on agricultural land. So, um, I don't Thank know if you. it is time to talk about the recommendations or that would be a second round. Thank you, Judith. We can talk about that later on in the second round, but okay. I hear a lot about Thank you. talking about system and the traditional way of uh, growing and so on. So, I move on to the next panelist, which will be Elizabeth this time. <laughs> I'm sorry for the second chance. <laughs> So I will start to speak as I'm wearing two hats actually because I previously was a scientist in agri working on agroforestry as well. So I will pick on that hat for, for this round, for the first round. And it makes me think about if you ask women and men, we, t we spoke a little bit about gender and I agree with so many of the points that have been made already. But if you ask women and men, they will have different opinions why they want agroforestry. And I just want to stress that because it's so important to ask both of them. And especially when we come with uh, looking at agroforestry as a way to mitigate climate change. And you come with these tree planting uh, offers. Uh, and usually the, the local farmers are not even asked probably, but more specifically, the men would be asked before the women. So this is so important to ask both of them and have a wide selection of, of trees that you can implement in your, um, in your farming systems. Uh, and you will understand why that is. And that brings me on then to what we're talking about here is we're lacking evidence of why agroforestry is so good to convince farmers, to convince policymakers and to convince uh, investors and I'm just thinking we're <laughs> you, you said before that that agroforestry proceed as a cost well actually that's not true and we have all the evidence to say that but we don't have the quantifiable measures and indicators to say that because we're comparing with the wrong things we're comparing against monoculture which mm -hmm. already is not paying the cost especially not the environmental costs and in the long term also on 
on people's agency to be able to be resilient and respond. During the pandemic, for example, we have so many evidence of that these small scale local farming systems were the ones who could quickly convert and re uh, purpose their production. So that's one on one on one hand. That's the the uh, the thing uh, to to say on on that uh, on the numbers. The other one is also that in the budget lines, coming back to these national adapta adaptation plans, national plans for biodiversity, all they all of these have such a potential to bring together synergies and showing at the country level internationally that agroforestry can contribute to so many different. Uh, commitments that countries have but uh, again we lack the numbers but we also in many countries who don't have their national adaptation plans the budget lines for agroforestry we have agriculture or forestry mm -hmm. and I've seen this in many of the countries where I worked and it would be so interesting to look in the countries that already uh, implemented these national plans whether that's changed how do they now account for agroforestry in the systems uh, even that, that would be such an interesting thing. And the last point I would like to say, when we speak of scales uh, and coming back to this need for, that Emily was talking about, we need for longer term types of, of projects that have different, I think they, they deal with different things, mm -hmm. different types of support over time because agroforestry systems may change, but also the need that farmers have to implement uh, their agroforestry mm -hmm. systems and go all the way to the processing throughout the value chain development mm -hmm. that may require different types of support and when we speak of scale just coming back to this the scale that we talk of as scientists and the scale that we talk of as development organizations is very different mm -hmm. and we just need to bring that into the equation as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Elisabeth, and uh, very concrete to ask both the w women and the men. And, and also, I think it's interesting with the, the different policies and strategies there are out there in, in many companies. However, the cross-functional work doesn't always mm. work out. So that's something that we might need to discuss further on. But now I'll let you in, Emily. Welcome. And you are from the Swedish Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation. And uh, you have a forestry background and experience from sustainable management in the forest sector. Yes, thank you. Um, actually, when I was reading the, uh, the brief, uh, I had the same sort of question a bit as Elaine. Like why, why isn't this already mm. scaled up? Mm. Um, and uh, I, would I also thought it quite similar as her with, do we need to differentiate between what is like a project, because uh, the project based are great, but it also, when talking about mm. scaling up, then you would like to have a bit more of a, an, an, an your own engine in the in the process. Yeah. So like farmers mm. being convinced that, oh, that worked well for you, I'll tr give it a go next year. Mm. That kind of momentum that could build, regardless of the amount of grants or, or s scrutiny boards that are, are applying mm. for these projects and yeah. so on. It's I'm not saying that we should. Th of course, the 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 grants and the and the development project should definitely be be there. But for scaling up, a, a mm. bit of more Ooh. word of mouth would be would be w wonderful. And then you, I think you need to talk a bit more about how can how can we scale up? How is this a business? How is it an attractive business? And of course, when you compare to monocultures. Mm. Uh, more numbers could be could be good to be able to compare, but also the sort of resilience. I mean, all the all the countries that need to come in with national adaptation plans, with their NDC, NDCs, it, has, it could have more could have been done so far. But we're still mm. in a point in time when all mm. countries are looking into like how do we manage our landscape sustainably. So there is a quite big mm. momentum where countries are actually looking for solutions yeah. and. Um, I was thinking uh, at the at the COP twenty seven now we, there was an I initiative called the Fast. I think Elaine, you might be. I'm not sure if you're involved, which is supposed to facilitate um, some uh, some of the w work on the in the agriculture sector. And I think this could probably fit well yeah. in. We're not all all that engaged in in that process, but the the FAO will be uh, is very much involved in it. Yeah. So I think perhaps these sort of capacity building measures where these kind of types of policy briefs and especially good examples 
where mm. where it has been done and yeah. upscale could you definitely bring things forward i'll stop there it's yes Go thank you forever. thank you emily <laughs> and and uh, i really hear that your uh, your want new methodologies to scale this up and I've, I've recently been in Tanzania and Kenya and I've really seen farmers that has benefited so much from agroforestry. So there are, of course, words out there, but I, I agree with you that it should be, be bigger and, and more words out there. So I leave uh, the floor to Sara and ask the same question to you. Uh, yes. Um, I work at the Extension Service Unit um, specializing in organic horticulture production. And I've been working with the topic of agroforestry since 2016. Uh, and the interest from farmers and advisors has increased significantly during this time, uh, also within the Swedish Board of Agriculture. But I have to um, say that I myself, uh, I'm, I'm quite passionate about agroforestry and um, that is uh, not the overall opinion within the Swedish Board of Agriculture. So I'm, I'm trying to promote agroforestry both within the Swedish Board of Agriculture and uh, to farmers and um, advisors uh, in my work. And um, I think the, the policy brief um, addresses both barriers for scaling up and opportunities um, very well. And I have, have, have met these barriers and opportunities when I, when I meet farmers and advisors. Um, and, and, and I can see what they, that they are str struggling with. And um, in, in Sweden, uh, many, many farmers are uh, reluctant to um, adopt uh, agroforestry systems because they are they are uh, afraid to lose their their subsidies uh, for the land um, if if they plant trees and and shrubs on the agricultural land. Um, I have. Um, some um, uh, comments on the recommendations, but I think we will take them later on. Yes, we take that in the next round. Thank you very much. And uh, what I hear from you is that there are barriers that could be um, taken away uh, quite easily or not, maybe not easy, but, but the, at least you're very concrete in this kind of barriers. So we take the next round and now I want to know uh, how the recommendations for scaling up agroforestry could work for you in your organization. What can you do? Because you're in from so many different angles. So what can you do from your angle to, to uh, meet this brief? So we take the same rounds. So I'll go to you, Elaine. Thank you. So FAO, we are especially working at, at a global level, um, as I do based in headquarters in Rome, Italy. I'm very much engaged in the science policy practice interface. I think as, as Linnea mentioned, there is a huge wealth of knowledge in the scientific community, but this is usually in scientific journals and not accessible to um, farmers, extensionist practitioners, definitely not policymakers. Um, and there's a lot to untangle there. It's also agroforestry is very context specific. So, you know, how do you take um, guidance or best practice, good practice from one place and, 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 translate that or, or replicate, adapt it to somewhere else. So a big part of what we do at FAO is to try and develop guidance um, and various knowledge products to try and uh, to bridge bridge those gaps, um, which I think is a big part on communication. How do we communicate about agroforestry differently to different target audiences? Um, how do we make that guidance relevant to target audiences? Um, we're actually in the process, we're working with World Agroforestry to develop a guide on, on agroforestry business cases. So not giving business cases, but actually what is needed for people to build their own agroforestry business cases, as, as an example. Um, we're also working with our farmer field schools, which is very focused on um, you know, farmers teaching other farmers. So this knowledge sharing. Uh, so we're developing agroforestry curricula 
for our, our farmer field schools. And this will allow uh, farmers, regardless of their context, to adapt agroforestry to their local environmental, uh, socioeconomic and cultural contexts um, and learn from, from each other. So I think we need to start promoting more communities of practice and, and knowledge sharing and, and FAO is very much part of that. Of course, we're also having member states um, as as our as our primary group, uh, our target audience. Looking at agroforestry policy is is key. So we've got our committees on on both agri agriculture and forestry. Um, they were held this year, and for the first time, we actually saw recommendations in for both committees. Um, so we had uh, we put forward recommendations to address agriculture and forestry linkages and for the first time we have recommendations uh, on agroforestry looking specifically at agroforestry monitoring um, and, and status of agroforestry because when we talk about scaling up what what does that mean because we don't actually know how much agroforestry we already have so how do we know that agroforestry is successful how do we make sure that agroforestry is not causing deforestation which we've seen in, in west africa with cocoa even in central america with um it, with avocado so when we promote agroforestry and we're promoting it as as judith said as as a land management um uh system natural capital system how do we make sure that we're not we're not promoting agroforestry at the cost of of other natural capital um, and 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 our natural ecosystems. So we're going to be starting to look at agroforestry monitoring. But I think bringing at the at the international level, agroforestry promoting its importance, which I think is actually done in a lot of ways. So how do we take that promotion and implement it on the ground? I think is is something we will be looking at, and that is looking at policies and national guidance, um, and but then also looking at farmer, farmer level and building capacities of those closer to the ground who will be implementing. Thank you so much, Elaine. I Thank think you. we need to move on. Uh, we, it's very interesting to listen, but I think we need to move on a bit. And so we go to Judith and, and please a bit shorter uh, <laughs> so, so we're, we all have the time to give their input. So please, Judith. Okay, I'll try to be. So there is, um, at Europe, there is much to say about uh, your first set recommendation, which is about um, developing national agroforestry policies. As uh, you in Sweden, you and know, and many of you know that also Europe worked on uh, uh, inserting uh, agroforestry definition and agroforestry targets in the uh, CAP national uh, strategic plans. We are not very much satisfied. Uh, actually, agroforestry has been mentioned very sparingly in the CAP pl uh, strategic plans of member states. But as we come to the, the local context, the point is that actually member states have a lot of freedom in interpreting and uh, implementing uh, these principles. So lobbying on an, on an European level is one thing. We, uh, Europe is under the process of evaluating the national plans and then we will try to do some activity on national level. So actually uh, all countries now have the definition of agroforestry in the CAP plans, but uh, in some cases this is very definite. Uh, no, it is not quantitative, in very many cases it is circular. So and then one more thing that I think is important, I try to be really short, is the recommendation number four here, uh, the know-how and the uh, extension services, uh, links to research institution. This is one of the things that Europe is in a special position because we have uh, members who are farmers, also researchers, also extensionists. So Europe is a kind of hub and we we hope to live up to the expectations let's say that such a posi position gives us its more responsibility so we try to work very much on this europe was part of the affinet project uh, which made its way to europe north and eureka and to the european farm book so actually the through the agroforestry thematic network so some work is done in this respect but there is very much more to do 
Thank you so much, Judith. Uh, I, I pass the word immediately to you, Elizabeth. <laughs> Thank you. So at CEDA, now I'm wearing the CEDA hat. Yep. So um, <laughs> we're, we're looking at agroforestry both for its role in development projects or in development initiatives, but also from humanitarian side. So you can have agroforestry mm. working with refugee camps, mm. for example, and we have examples that B. Skogen is involved yep. with as well. So I think this is really, really interesting. And so from the recommendations, I think they're a really good summary of uh, that we need to develop further in terms of uh, specific mm. guidelines for the people at CEDA who are developing projects or who are developing new strategies and how we can implement this further on, on into the strategies mm -hmm. throughout this, the cycles of a strategy on the portfolios and down to the to the in specific um, uh, uh, initiatives that we are doing so i think that that's what i would would like to do now and sit down with with uh, some of the the, man the project managers really and, and look at what specific concrete questions would they need to look for the synergies and that, that could mean both as I was mentioning earlier on to the, uh, the commitments to, to Rio conventions but also to the UN Food System Summit action okay. plans that we have now coming up this mm -hmm. year or next year in 23 and how this can create jobs and, and uh, responsible innovations I think is an important way of, of funding as well through private capital so uh, I'm not going to go into further detail. I think I'll stop there. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. It's very we good that plans. you are at, at CEDA and have this because I mean it's a lot of knowledge in in this area. Mm. So it's very mm. good that CEDA has the the knowledge. Mm. Why are you? So we go to Emily. Well, um, I think overall the the recommendations uh, are, are good. Uh, they are very very clear. Uh, it's a more um, a matter of who does what yeah. um, <laughs> in in, mm. in the, the, the different different level. Um, which is, of course, will mean different things in different countries. But I, I do believe I, that we are in a quite interesting stage where uh, we're looking at sustainable land management. We're looking; most countries are looking to like how do we how do we go about our commitments on the Rio Conventions, mm -hmm. while also addressing food security. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is. Um, I can force it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, but uh, it is defini def like definitely con yeah. context specific. But I do think whether you, uh, the recommendations are, are pretty on point, but will mean different things in different countries. Great. And Sara. Uh, yes, I will give you some some examples of what the Swedish Board of Agriculture is already doing to promote agroforestry in Sweden. Um, we improve the, the extension services to advisors by highlighting agroforestry in, at the conferences, courses and on field trips we arrange. We support farmers' adoption to agroforestry via information to advisors and through the written material in form of newsletters, guidebooks and leaflets um, we are uh, doing. Regarding policies, and there is quite a long way, uh, a long road ahead before we have a national agroforestry plan in Sweden. We have, however, taken the first step by suggesting a definition of agroforestry in Sweden to the Commission. Um, we support agroforestry research and development by funding several ongoing projects. And we have cooperated with uh, Agroforestry Sweden mm. at their conferences and field trips. So, um, in as a summary, I would say that we are working with four out of seven recommendations um, in in the policy brief. Wow! And the other three ones, they are not a question for a governmental office, so they are not in within our scope. Thank you so much, Sara. Uh, I think we have a fantastic method here, and we really want to work, work and get that more implemented. Uh, do we have any questions from the um, from the audience? Uh, please send them in in the chat so we can uh, answer them. 
So, but something that I, I wondered when I when I read this is that uh, when I was in in Tanzania and Kenya, then it was scaling up. We were more talking about like big plots of land instead of small plots of land, but that is only one part of the scaling up. So, how do you see? Is it possible to scale it up in in like larger farms, or or is it more for small farmers, smallholder farmers, Elizabeth? Well, when I was at ICRAF, we separate between scaling what we scale up and how, and, and scaling up what we scale up and, and how we scale up. Mm. So the what is what, what trees do you plant and what trees, these are very context specific, but the approaches that you do, for example, you need a certain distance between rows if you intercrop or, mm. or to take away the canopy and avoid competition. That's something you can scale up at a larger area if you yeah. if you if you if you, if you want to talk like that. But yeah. the, but the exactly uh, the crops you grow in a system that very dependent on lots of conditions, of course, agroecological zones and down to the microclimate. Yeah. Mm. Thank you for that. I have a question here. Uh, do you see any risks with efforts to scale up agroforestry? I give that to. I don't know if FAO might be the right one for this. Uh, I mean, there's there are, there are always risks, and I think uh, the a big risk are actually the barriers that are listed in in this policy brief: issues on source material, existing capacity, and and extension. Um, I mean, investment would need to go in to making sure that as as we're scaling up, we have the abilities to 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 scale up and and the capacities to scale up. I think this is a big one. I mean, we're also talking about um, you know we're talking about land and 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 whether or not we even have have the land and and tenure to 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 scale this up and who is involved. So absolutely, there there are always. There are always risks. Uh, there are always trade-offs. I mean, even speaking previously to to what um, Elizabeth yeah. just said, you know, when you when you when you scale up agroforestry, even on an implementation side, you could actually play with different types of systems on larger plots of land. Mm -hmm. You don't have to scale up the the same the t same system. Yeah. Um, so yeah, a lot of it is, do we have the knowledge? I think is is one, and then do we have the the resources, human and, and financial resources, yeah. to scale up agroforestry and, and do it properly yeah. as well? Uh, and we have some from the audience. Can high costs be a barrier to agroforestry development? I think I don't know who who is uh, the one who wants to ask. This. Maybe you, Judith, who works with with a farm. Yes, I can try. Well, um, I think that the financial planning is crucial. And this is one thing, again, that might have been neglected by a little bit by uh, researchers and um, by advisory services, let's say, because actually you will have the returns from agroforestry uh, systems, even in timber or non-timber non products. But if it is uh, really well planned, the costs should not outnumber the incomes, let's say, but it is really about planning. And um, relevant uh, business plans and uh, operations plans also for agroforestry systems are indeed uh, a little bit in um, in delay in arriving, I guess. So I think that in a, even in an in a EU level, they were first working on the environmental, ben environmental benefits, which I think are, are obvious by now, especially with all those uh, scientific results that we have. And there are a little bit of less evidence on the economic uh, profitability and um, um, agroforestry systems. So I think that is a crucial point to work on. Yeah, and, and in development countries, I can can uh, think that there is a barrier in in, in the startup. Mm. Uh, Linnea, do you have something? Uh, no, I just like the implementation phase can be very costly, as you just said, Judith. But I mean, in the long run, you actually benefit benefit from mm. it. So that's what we really need to emphasize: is that we need these insurance systems for the beginning mm. and like microcredits or whatever to start up these projects. But in the end the farmers will benefit from yeah. it. They will be the, the winners. I think it's as mm. with all sustainability yeah. issues yeah. that we need to look <laughs> a bit further than just the uh, quarterly uh, annual report. Uh, sure. A good question to Emily. Is there any interest knowledge at all in the government about agroforestry? 
how can we increase it? Within Sweden? Uh, or I don't know, that's concept? the question. <laughs> yes, in Sweden. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, well, I think there is uh, knowledge and also we, ha we have a panelist from the, from the Board of Agriculture uh, with us, so I would assume Pre present present uh, a lot of it. Yeah. Um, mm. In terms of how big agroforestry is in Sweden, I think one of the concept specific aspects in Sweden is that we have seventy percent forest and mm -hmm. uh, seven percent of their land is agriculture. Yeah. Mm. And I think uh, I agriculture is not really my area, so I'm speaking a little bit out of terms. But I generally, if a, if a farmer wants to increase the amount of trees, then you mm. would a forest, uh, work with afforestation rather yeah. than mm. than uh, working with sp sparse trees and all mm. I assume also for co competition. But I'll, I'll prefer to pass the question. Yeah. Someone else that to wants to to, uh, to, our, to our expert at the at the, at the government yeah. meeting, perhaps. Yeah. Can you please re repeat the question? Uh, I is there any invest knowledge at all in the government about agroforestry and how can we increase it? Um, I, I would say there there is not knowledge uh, about that. Um, um, yes, okay. um, but but I, I I agree with Elaine. I think it's a um, a matter of, of, of planning, and um, uh, th there there are ways to to combine agroforestry with. Um, um, short annual crops, for example, to to get an. Uh, um, um, re return in the first years, and and then uh, you can get in, in uh, um, f from from the trees uh, later on. Um, Thank you. I think the the audience is yeah. now awakening up, so we got a lot of, of uh, <laughs> questions here. But I think we're just gonna we're gonna end up this this uh, with a round up. So I just want you to like give your uh, your recommendations for for agroforestry network in the future on what we should do. So just a quick round. So we we start as we usually do with Elaine. <laughs> um, Sure. I mean, I think issuing more more things like this, like the policy brief, engaging different different stakeholders in in conversations, and I think continuing to build communities of practice to to allow different stakeholders to share their their issues and and get um, and and be able to converse with others. Thank you. And Judith, what's your recommendation? Yes, thank you. I was thinking actually about the issue that was already mentioned here, the, let's say, smallholders, farm, farms versus, um, let's say, industrial scale agriculture, that indeed, um, it's not because agriculture is, cannot be as profitable as um, a large, large scale uh, production want to be, but the concept is much in a more distance from that system. So probably we will need two different strategies and two different aspects to um, inflict some changes in both areas. Thank you so much. And Elizabeth? I would like to go on the uh, the lessons learned and the evidence from the implementation of these national adaptation plans for uh, national plans for agroforestry mm -hmm. and what lessons learned there are from the countries that have already implemented them at the national plan or or maybe a regional plan or whatever there are and also look at how the investments were made in those cases because mm -hmm. I think here there's an opportunity to uh, work more with private private sector, but how has the private sector been in, engaged in those uh, implement in the implementation yeah. of of, ag of those plans? Mm -hmm. Thank you, and Emily. Well, um, I think we're, there is could be a more more need for for monitoring and uh, sort of measuring uh, mm -hmm. also in in okay. relation to what what mm -hmm. is being done. We mm -hmm. have the national adaptation plans and. As well as the NDCs, once we have the, glo the global, next global stock take, I think there will be more mm -hmm. information to gather, and perhaps there can be a little bit more information on uh, where we are and perhaps mm -hmm. what, what initiatives are taken. I think generally also s spreading the word of, uh, of success stories, yeah. and perhaps also uh, where things haven't worked out the way yeah. the way planned. Mm -hmm. I think just mm -hmm. yeah, experience building experiences uh, will probably help. Thank you. 
And we go to Sara and then we go to Linnea. Mm. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I think for for farmers to scale up uh, agroforestry, they need to, to see good examples, uh, successful examples um, from other places. There, there are some, some farms in Sweden um, practicing agroforestry, um, but um, I would like to see more more example um, with uh, um, growing trees and shrubs and annual crops and and having livestock uh, at the same place. Mm. So a, a whole um, uh, system. Mm. Thank you. And Linnea, what's your recommendation? Yeah. Really invest in markets mm. because I think that the markets are not developed for these diversified system. If a farmer produces more than one crop, then it's so difficult for them to sell their produce. So I would really say that we need to emphasize and create, like uh, like I said, producer groups and really make it beneficial for, for small farmers or large scale farmers to just have these diversified systems. Because today it's like everything works against them and it's so much easier to just have monocultures. And I think that's the way to scale up because that really forces people to yes. to do something better. Mm. Thank you. And I hear that there are a lot of interesting recommendations for Agroforestry Network in, in the chat as well. So the audience has really given us uh, a lot of recommendations. So with that said, I want to say thank you for, for everybody who's listening and to this fantastic panel and especially to you, Linnea, who was mm. presenting the brief. And uh, I just want to show you also that we have the brief here and so you can read afterwards. So uh, thank you very much for today, everybody. Thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. It was very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.